Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar titled Physical Characterization Methods for Cathode Powders. My name is Jeff Kenvin, and I am the Vice President of Science at Micromeritics Instrument Corporation. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple engagement tools you may use. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Additional materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. If you experience any problems during the session, you can find answers to some common technical issues located in the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available after today's webcast and will be emailed to you once the session has concluded. Please to introduce our speakers for this webinar, Tony Thornton and Jack Sod. Tony has more than 40 years of experience with micromeritics and in the field of material characterization. His expertise includes techniques for particle size, pore symmetry, physisorption, chemisorption, and pycnometry, and has contributed to the development of these techniques here at Micromeritics. Tony received both undergraduate and graduate degrees from Emory University. He is a fellow of ASTM and recently honored with the ASTM Cavanaugh Award for his outstanding leadership and contributions to and the promotion of international standards development. Jack Sod has more than 20 years of experience in the field of material characterization with extensive experience in, in the pharmaceutical industry with Keele Laboratories, Elan Pharmaceuticals, and Micromeritics. His experience includes techniques for particle size and pycnometry. Jack received his BS degree in chemistry from the University of Georgia, and Jack is currently an application scientist at Microsoft and has led our efforts to create online training and education for users of micromeritics instruments. Tony and Jack, it is an honor for me to introduce you today. We are so glad you could be here today to share your insights on physical characterization methods for cathode powders. Thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. Again, my name is Jack Saad, and I'm a senior application scientist with Micromeritics Instrument Corporation. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, physical characterization methods for cathode powders. My colleague Tony Thornton and I did a lot of work in this uh, area and uh, we're excited to present you with the data. The physical characteristics we'll be talking about today are density, particle size, surface area, and porosity. To determine density, we use a gas displacement pycnometer and a dry powder displacement pycnometer. For uh, particle size and size distribution, uh, we used air permeability analysis and uh, sedimentation analysis. For specific surface area, we use gas absorption, air permeability, and sedimentation analysis. For porosity and pore size distribution, we also use gas absorption as well as mercury intrusion porosimetry. The material we used is a lithium iron phosphate, or LFP. Uh, this, is, this material is used um, in the battery industry to make cathodes. Uh, it's commercially available from chemical suppliers and widely used in the battery industry. The reason why we chose LFP is that it seems to be in the headlines a lot these days. You can see some of the big names like Ford and Tesla are using this in their, as part of their battery manufacturing process. For this study, we purchased a large quantity of LFP from a commercially available source. Uh, we then characterized the um, LFP by the above mentioned techniques. Uh, then we had the LFP modified by atomic layer deposition or ALD in order to make it hydrophobic. This was done in order to mimic any process where LFP is modified. Uh, the modified LFP is then characterized by the same techniques to see how the textural changes can be detected and characterized. Starting out with a visual inspection, we can see that the materials look a little bit different, or the, um, the LFP on the left, which is the unmodified LFP, 
looks to be more uh, granular. Maybe some more finds are present. Um, the modified LFP on the right uh, looks like there's maybe some larger particles present. You can see some maybe what looks to be aggregates or agglomerates. Um, but um, you can kind of visually see that they're slightly different. The first technique we used is gas pycnometry. This is used to determine the skeletal density. The volume of an inner gas displaced in the chamber is equal to the volume of the material under test. If you know the mass of the material, then we can calculate the uh, density. Uh, the results are usually referred to as skeletal density, but also called true density or absolute density. Uh, this is a time-tested uh, technique based on Archimedes, where we look at the true volume of a material with an irregular shape. The results of the analysis on the Acupic 2 1345 shows that the density of the LFP decreased as a result of the coating or modification. So the modified LFP has a little bit lower density than the uh, uh, uncoated or unmodified LFP. Now I'll hand it over to my colleague Tony to discuss the next technique. Thanks, Jack. The GeoPIC 1365 also determines the volume of the sample under test using a displacement technique. In this case, it is the displacement of a powder. A cylinder of known controlled diameter is used to hold the sample under test. The displacement of a piston without the sample at program consolidation force and thus pressure is recorded. The test specimen is then added and the displacement determined for the same consolidation force. The difference in displacement and the diameter of the cylinder are used to determine the displacement volume of the test specimen. Either we are determining the displacement of a known powder by an unknown form piece or pieces, known as envelope volume, from which we can use sample mass to determine envelope density, or we are characterizing an unknown powder using the transverse axial pressure, TAP, option, determining the compacted bed volume and density. If we use the skeletal density that Jack just described, we can determine the porosity either of the form pieces under test or the compacted powder bed under test. First, we characterized the original LFP powder using the TAP option. Bed volumes were determined over a range of compacted pressures from about 0.5 to 3.5 kilopascal. Using the sample mass under test, we can calculate a compacted powder bed density for each measured bed volume, again, as a function of the compaction pressure. And by utilizing the skeletal density determined using the AccuPIC, we can determine a compacted bed volume as a function of applied pressure. Note that this porosity can be used to predict the quantity of electrolyte needed when using the LFP for lithium ion battery electrodes, again, as a function of applied pressure when preparing the electrode. Comparing the two materials, the original unmodified LFP, shown here in red, and the surface modified LFP, shown in blue, we can see that the unmodified material exhibits a higher porosity for each compaction pressure, and thus the LFP is more compactable after surface treatment than before. Thanks, Tony. The Micromergix Subsev Autosizer 2 5800 uses air permeability and the kazini karman equation to calculate powder bed porosity average particle size, and specific surface area. The amount of sample needed is equivalent to one cubic centimeter of skeletal volume. We use the density value that we calculated from the AccuPIC analysis to determine the mass needed for this analysis. I covered this technique in more detail in a previous webinar, Understanding Surface Area Measurement Techniques. But in short, a powder bed is compressed to a certain height and a bed porosity is uh, calculated. A constant airflow is applied to the bottom of the bed and uh, the pressure drop across the powder bed is then used to calculate a specific surface area using the kazini karman equation. The density is then used to determine the average particle size. The results of the air permeability analysis on the LFP and modified LFP shows that the uh, powder bed porosity decreased, meaning that the modified LFP is compressed to a lower height. Um, the size results also shows that the uh, particle size increased and the specific surface area decreased. The next technique is sedimentation analysis using the Micromerdix Cetograph 3 Plus. This is used to determine a particle size distribution by incorporating the Beer-Lambert law or Beer's law and Stokes law. 
It is a widely accepted technique that is still used as a particle sizing standard globally and continues to withstand the test of time. Stokes' law states that if particles are of uniform density and the liquid viscosity and density are also known, a particle size can be determined based on the sedimentation velocity. In other words, the bigger particles will settle faster than the smaller particles. This is really convenient since this technique also captures a powder's behavior in a slurry as well as giving particle size information. The results of the analysis on the setograph shows that the modified LFP has larger particle sizes present than the LFP. You can uh, see that in the D50 and D10 values, there's a dramatic difference between those values. Uh, we can also see that in the mean value, the D43, which is the uh, mass weighted mean diameter. Um, I also have reported here the mean 23 or 32 uh, value, which is the surface area weighted mean diameter, as well as the specific surface area calculated from the particle size distribution. Looking at the size frequency plot, we can see that the LFP is bimodal and the modified LFP only has one mode. The single mode of the modified LFP seems to match the coarser mode of the LFP distribution around 10 microns. It is important to note that the uh, LFP was dispersed in water with surfactants and the modified LFP was dispersed in an organic liquid with surfactants since it is hydrophobic. Both were treated with ultrasonics. To confirm the organic dispersion did not influence the reported particle size distribution, the LFP was dispersed again using the exact same organic preparation as the modified LFP. You can see in the overlay of the aqueous and organic dispersions of the LFP on the left that show very little difference in the amount of fines. Reviewing the same statistics, the LFP aqueous dispersion and the LFP organic dispersion seem to agree. The D10, D50, and D90 values are in the same ballpark, as well as the mean values and the specific surface area. We can conclude that the dispersion did not affect the reported size results. We can further conclude that the fine particles in the LFP are not present in the modified LFP. Jack has described a couple of methods for determination of particle size and envelope surface area for these and other powdered materials. Here we describe another method, that of gas physisorption, which is commonly used to determine the specific surface area of materials using the method of Brunauer, Emmett, and Teller, also known as BET, from the volume of gas physically adsorbed by the sample as a function of pressure. For most physisorption analyses, the sample is evacuated and held at cryogenic temperature, often that of liquid nitrogen. A volume of adsorptive, again, often nitrogen, is dosed into the sample holder to provide a target pressure relative to the equilibrium saturation pressure of the adsorptive at the controlled bath temperature. When using nitrogen as the adsorptive dosed onto a sample held at liquid nitrogen temperature, the saturation pressure is essentially atmospheric. The dose molecules strike the surface of the test specimen and some will adsorb onto the sample. A lesser quantity will desorb and eventually an equilibrium quantity of adsorbed molecules will remain on the surface as a function of the pressure of gas molecules not adsorbed. This quantity of gas adsorbed as a function of relative pressure at constant temperature is the physisorption isotherm for the sample. The amount adsorbed at any given pressure is a function of the amount of exposed sample surface and the sample surface energy. Using the method of Brunner, Emmett, and Teller, we can determine the number of molecules needed to form a single layer on the open surface of the sample. This monolayer capacity, coupled with the amount of surface covered by each molecule, gives the surface area of the test specimen. Using the mass of the specimen, the specific surface area can be calculated. In addition to the BET specific surface area, the BETC value can be determined, which is related to the strength of the physical adsorption bond between the sample surface and the adsorbed gas molecules. Note that even though the specific surface area of the LFP only changed slightly after surface modification, the C value changed drastically. This indicates that the nitrogen molecules are not attracted to the modified surface as strongly as to the unmodified surface. Thus, the BET surface area determined from the physical gas adsorption can yield information on the relative surface energy 
of the test specimen. In addition to specific surface area, we can calculate an average particle size based upon the assumption of spherical shape of the particles and using the skeletal density of the material from the AccuPIC analysis. We can see the direct result of the reduced surface energy by examining an overlay of the full physisorption isotherm for the modified and unmodified LFP material. Notice the higher uptake at low relative pressures for the unmodified sample shown in blue. The isotherm rises quickly at low pressures then rolls over to a region of more gradual uptake as a function of relative pressure. This sample shows a definite knee in the isotherm at well below 0.1 relative pressure. With a surface modified material, this initial steep rise in amount is served as a function of relative pressures not seen in the orange curve. There is not an initial strong reaction with the surface only, but rather the amount of gas adsorbed becomes enhanced as more gas is adsorbed for the modified material. For the unmodified material, the attraction between the sample surface and the adsorbing gas molecules is stronger than that between two adsorbing molecules. Whereas for the modified material, that attraction between sample surface and adsorbing gas molecules is not so much greater than that between adjacent gas molecules. The difference between adsorption force and condensation force between the gas molecules is what drives the C value from the BFT method. And here we see it graphically in the overlay of the adsorption isotherms. We can use the adsorption isotherm with density functional theory methods to calculate the amount of surface area detected as a function of surface energy. Notice that the majority of the gas adsorbs onto the modified LFP with lower surface energies shown in orange than onto the modified LFP in blue. We can definitely quantify differences in adsorption potential for materials with different surface characteristics. Here, the incremental surface areas as a function of surface energy are shown. Note that there is a large peak at low surface energies for the unmodified sample, and also a lack of peaks at high surface energies as seen for the unmodified sample. The BET transformation plots shown here include location of the monolayer capacity, the relative pressure at which the monolayer forms. Notice for the unmodified material shown on the left that the monolayer capacity is reached at a much lower relative pressure than it is for the modified material shown on the right. Again, we're seeing a direct representation of the difference in attractive force between the gas molecules and these two surfaces uh, shown in the BET results coming from the gas adsorption isotherms. Another method for differentiating materials is mercury intrusion pore symmetry, MIP. Here the volume of mercury intruding into open porosity of a test specimen is determined as a function of applied pressure. Typically, this method is used to determine the pore volume and pore area distributions of material as a function of applied pressure and thus opening size. In addition, bulk and skeletal densities can be determined based upon the amount of mercury displaced. This is just one more displacement technique that gives us volume and density of the material. From the MIP analysis of the two LFP samples, we do see some differences, but using BET surface area and AccuPIC skeletal density values, we can say that all that we see here is interstitial filling of mercury between the particles that make up the test specimens and no pore fillings. The differences seen in the intrusion curves are consistent with differences in agglomeration of the dry particles as no sample dispersion is used prior to the MIP analysis. Now Jack is going to take over and begin a discussion uh, to summarize what we have seen today. Thanks, Tony. Uh, recall from my previous webinar, Understanding Surface Area Measurement Techniques, um, the comparison of surface area calculations showed that BET gives the uh, largest specific surface area value and the smallest particle size value, while traditional particle sizing techniques yield the smallest specific surface area value and the largest particle size value. Air permeability falls in between. Comparing the LFP and the modified LFP, the air permeability analysis and the sedimentation analysis agree that the size increased and the surface area decreased with the surface modification. There is no significant difference in the size and surface area uh, based on BET. 
the conclusion we can draw from this is that the modification process may have caused the fine particles to stick to the surface of the coarse particles. This scenario would explain why traditional particle sizing techniques like air permeability analysis and sedimentation analysis showed larger particle sizes for the modified LFP. The fine particles are still present because the BET surface area did not significantly decrease. Additionally, as Tony mentioned, the C value from the BET analysis showed a large difference demonstrating that the surface did change and that gas adsorption is sensitive enough to detect this. Looking at the entire body of work, we can make some key observations regarding the methods available to characterize cathode powders. The gas spectrometer data shows that the skeletal density decreased demonstrating a difference in the LFP powders. The adsorption data also shows a difference and goes further by specifying that the surface of the LFP has changed in affinity to the gas molecules as illustrated by the C value. The Micromertix AccuPick and 3Flex are useful tools if the surface of a powder is being modified. The dry powder pyctometer and air permeability particle size analyzer both use force to consolidate the powder to give density, average particle size, and specific surface area. The combination of the dry powder pyctometer and the gas pyctometer gives powder bed porosity information. The Micromertix GeoPig, SubSiv AutoSizer, and AccuPig are useful tools if the powder is being compressed as in a calendaring process in addition to surface modification. Adsorption, air permeability, and sedimentation analysis all report specific surface area and an average surface weighted particle size. Additionally, sedimentation reports a complete particle size distribution. The Micromertix 3Flex, SubSiv AutoSizer, and Cetograph are useful tools if the powder is being milled in addition to surface modification. Reviewing all the values calculated by the various techniques, one value stands out as probably the most critical. All the data used a skeletal density value to make the appropriate calculations. The skeletal or true density helps to determine the powder purity, uh, calculate powder bed porosity, perform air permeability and sedimentation analysis, convert size data to surface area data, and vice versa, and other process critical calculations. The Micromertix AccuPick is a great addition to any laboratory where reliable density value is needed. One of the future projects is to study the F LFP powder using the FT4 powder rheometer. For basic flowability, we're going to be looking to see how the much energy is required to move the particles under constrained and unconstrained uh, flow. We're going to look at aeration to see how that changes as we aerate the particles with different flow rates of gas through them. We can look at the consolidation of the powder bed with tapping, as well as study the effects of shear and wall friction on the materials. In addition to that, we can study compressibility and permeability, kind of like what we did with the GeoPick, looking at the changes in porosity with applied forces. But in this case, for, with the compressibility, we can also study the permeability by looking at the pressure drop as we flow air across the comp compacted bed. We would like to thank our colleagues on the applications team and on the contract lab services team, the PTA, for their help in collecting the data. Uh, we'd also like to thank you for attending today's webinar. We hope that you found the information presented uh, useful and uh, gives you some additional things to consider while working with your materials. At this time, I think we're going to move to the Q uh, question and answer session.